Hi, everyone. Hello, everybody. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead. Um, we've been recording the main session, and I'm going to also record this session. So that way, it's a resource for faculty once um, this event is over with that you can kind of come back to. So I just want to let you know that. And we've got several different um, faculty that are um, here with us. So we've got Ellen, um, we've got Zara, we've got um, Virginia, um, and then there's also myself that are kind of here to Give you a little bit about how we use some of these strategies in our classes. Um, so I'll let Ellen kind of go first and then we'll kind of go down the line. We'll let, have Ellen and then we'll have Virginia and Zara and then I'll go last um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Okay so um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about flipping a class. So I flipped classes quite a bit pre-COVID and post COVID, I've flipped all of my classes. So if you've never heard of what a flipped class is, the idea is that in a normal class, students, you know, attend a lecture and sort of, um, you know, listen to their professor discussing in the class and then do the hard work of working through problem sets outside of class. I'm a math professor, by the way, for those of you who don't know me. So for me, homework is problem sets. Um, of various types. And um, in a flipped class, those two are flipped. So you um, have the students attend lecture or somehow learn the material in advance. And then during class, they will go through the hard work of working through challenging problems together in small groups, potentially, or all together. Um, how exactly that happens is pretty flexible. So when I have flipped my classes, um, both pre-COVID and post-COVID, I have recorded my own lectures on um, an app called Explain Everything that I use on my iPad. Um, post, I guess, uh, over the summer, I got um, an Apple Pencil, which really helped in terms of being able to write on the iPad. I used styluses before that, before, um, though, and it worked fine. Um, but so I tried to keep my lectures short. So 10 to 15 minutes and students would watch two videos, maybe three for each class period. So this was most of what I would do during a class, except there was no back and forth. So normally in class, there's a lot of me um, interacting with the students, the students working together on problems, and that all obviously was cut from the uh, recorded lecture. And so it was just, you know, here's the material, let's go through a few examples. And then when we would meet together in class, we would do problems. So pre-COVID, so I'm trying to sort of remember what I'm supposed to be saying. So pre-COVID, um, generally I would hand out to the students um, like a problem set and have them work in small groups that I switched up either every class period or every week. Um, and I would walk around to all the groups, support them as they're working on their problem sets. Sometimes I would break us all up so that, well, break, break those groups up so that we were all talking together at the board at some problem that everybody was having issues with, or I might have them you know, present to each other um, but pre-COVID, it was mostly small group work. Post-COVID, I did a bit more of um, me actually working through problems in front of the whole class um, so that it was probably, I don't know, half and half, half the time I would spend working through problems that the students had questions on. And then sometimes I'd have them work in small groups in the breakout rooms and they could work on a Jamboard there. Um, if none of you have heard of Jamboard before, it's something in the G Suite. It's an online whiteboard, shared whiteboard space that students can use. Um, and I found that my students, I, I, I honestly have been surprised. Um, I, they, they like it a lot more than I expected. I think the reason they like the flipped class is they can rewatch the videos that they need help with. And they 
feel like they really have someone there to answer their questions when they have them, when they're grappling with the challenging problems. Um, so I think that's really all that I wanted to say about flipped classes. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Okay, um, how about Virginia? You go next. Sure, um, I'm Virginia McCarthy. I have been teaching the Sundance Film Festival course at St. Mary's since 1997. Uh, and Sammy was one of my former students, so it's fun to see his frozen face right there in front of me. Uh, <laughs> but um, I'm also a St. Mary's graduate, uh, undergrad BA from St. Mary's in religious studies and English, and then my master's in theology from St. Mary's back in the 80s. So um, I wanted to talk about a class I co-taught this year with Nori Palmer. And this was a screenwriting course since I couldn't take students to Sundance this year. So we taught a screenwriting course and we did the most ridiculous thing, which was to have students write a feature film in four weeks. So <laughs> that was a huge heavy lift. And believe me, I will do it differently if I ever do it again. Um, so my part, one of my pieces in that was guest speakers, lining up guest speakers. Now, another thing to share with you is <clears throat> for about, um, well, since 1993, I've been working as a script supervisor on feature films, television, commercial projects, and uh, I've done about over 33 feature films over the years. And so I have a lot of connections in the uh, film and television production world. So I lined up several guest speakers, colleagues of mine who are producers, filmmakers, directors, screenwriters, so forth. We had about 13 guest speakers. And so what we did is the first half of class, we went over uh, instruction regarding um, screenwriting technique. And then we would end the class with the guest speaker. Now, prior to the guest speaker coming on, I had a conversation with each guest speaker and I told them what the class was about and I narrowed down the scope of what they would be talking with the students about. I asked them first to introduce themselves and tell the students how they um, started off their career and how it evolved over time to give the students a sense of it, because some students in the class would like to pursue a career in production or screenwriting. So to give them a sense of different stories of how people got from point A to point B. And then I asked them to then talk about screenwriting specifically and, and wisdom they have or suggestions they have about screenwriting and their, from their own experience or from producing scripts or so forth. Um, and then after that pre-interview, that's basically, um, like I said, what the, the speakers did. And Nori and I would moderate the discussion for about the first 30 minutes. So we would make it a discussion rather, rather than just a presentation. Um, and then for the last 15 to 20 minutes, we opened it to students for, for them to ask questions. And um, I thought the pre-interview was very useful to kind of focus the speaker because I have had guest speakers in the past in my Sundance class, and sometimes they just kind of go off in left field. It's a little hard to corral them back in, right? So, um, and then um, if I what I would change about it is um, I would probably in the future, I didn't expect 13 speakers to accept my, my, you know, I didn't, all of them would do it, but it worked out. It really worked out. But in the future, I would, um, depending on how many speakers I was ha have, I would assign a few students to be prepared. What we would do also, I forgot to mention, I gave for every speaker, the students had links to uh, articles about them or their work or their IMDB page. And they were assigned to read the material so they would be familiar with some of the story of each speaker. And then I probably would have students be in charge of, of being part of the discussion with Nori and I or to uh, start off the question answer period with their own questions. Um, I think I would, we did have them evaluate afterwards and I would continue to do that, but I might um, have assigned um, a final reflection on all the speakers on in some way, pulling it all together, what they learned. And so that's pretty much it, I guess. I think I covered all the bases. 
Thanks, Virginia. All right, Zari, why don't you go ahead and and I know you've had experience with guest speakers or you know maybe um, structuring class discussions. I'll let you go ahead and talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So my uh, what I was going to share is is pretty similar to Virginia in a lot of ways. Since um, so. I specifically this came up because we were talking about Jan term and being online for you know three hours, four days a week, three hours a day, four days a week. And so I mentioned that surprisingly, even though you know um, we were talking about technology, having the guest speakers, that's a relatively low tech um, strategy, but it actually seemed to work really well to keep student interest. And um, so I co-taught a class this past Jan term with Teresa Kramer in the Writing Center, and um, it was called a, a portal into Tibetan Buddhism. And of course, we had intended it for it to be a travel course, but when we converted it to online, we decided to make it, um, give it kind of a similar structure to a retreat, to a, a Buddhist retreat. And so, and but since it's an intro level, and and we knew that most of the students knew very little or you know maybe some about Buddhism so we wanted to keep it very um, accessible and so by intentionally integrating many many guest speakers we had we only had two community partners though so I thought it, it worked well that we had you know a relatively like narrow focus we worked with the Nyingma Institute which is in San Francisco and the East Bay Meditation Center in Oakland and then we, um, within the, the context of all the different offerings that these two partners offered, we had the students engage in, you know, they could choose six hours, they had to do six hours for each partner, but they could choose, you know, which workshop, which practice group they wanted to attend. And um, so that was kind of the individual engagement. And then we had the leaders of our workshops, um, come and into our class as guest speakers, so similar to Virginia. And I also thought it was really important that because I framed them as guest lecturers, um, and we talked a lot about how in a community engagement context, our partners are co-educators. And so I, I thought it was really important to let students know that these aren't just kind of visitors um, to our class, they are helping to teach the class. And so for um, similar to Virginia, we had like for each of our guest speakers, we had the students, we assigned a reading or a work. There were a couple of films um, that was either written by the guest speaker or the guest lecturer or um, kind of the, the, the Nyingma Institute like has a couple of core films that they use and they orient their work around. And so like we had the, the students watch um, those films and then we actually were able to get the director of one of the films to come and, and, and you know speak to the class. And so it was really, well integrated and I thought that it gave it a great balance between you know having multiple voices communicate key content so they weren't like an extra this was like an integral part of the class and at the same time because students had an opportunity to read their work or you know watch their work hear from the speaker but then also attend one of their classes so my teacher at East Bay Meditation Center Mushim Ikeda she has written um, a couple, well, several articles. So we had students read her work. Uh, she came to the class several times, but then she also teaches an intro, uh, beginning a meditation practice, a workshop for the community. And so students were able to go to that as well. And so they, they were able to kind of, the questions that they had, I think were richer and the conversation was richer because it wasn't just a one-time thing where some random person shows up and then disappears. And, um, and we asked them to journal, to keep a daily journal and reflect on the community engagement and the readings overall. And that was that re was really telling because even though sometimes the students were really shy and one of the things that I did see that worked better was when we asked students to submit questions in advance and then we facilitated the Q&A as compared to having the speaker speak and then we just say, any questions? And a couple of those times students maybe only had a few questions, but then in their journals, they wrote so much. And so I made it a point to share some of the comments they made in their journals with the speakers so that they understood that even though the students might've still been processing, but it's clear from these journals that they did, they got a lot out of it. And they continued to write about, you know, speakers that we had at the beginning of class, they continue to kind of connect the dots and, and talk about, you know, what they were learning towards the end of the class. And I thought that was really powerful and important too. 
So of course, in person that definitely translates, but one of the conveniences was that we didn't have to worry about a lot of the logistics as far as travel time, parking permits, giving folks a map to campus or finding them when they get to class, all things because I've done this in person. Um, but of course, what was lost is that in-person energy. And we tried to make up for that by encouraging the guest speakers to be really interactive, to incorporate like stretch breaks and like demonstrations of the work they do. And they were really great. One teacher used visual aids <laughs> and they were really, really goofy, but that's what made, we all had a lot of fun with it. And so, um, so yeah, I thought it overall, it worked really well. Thanks, Aaron, Virginia, um, for that. And uh, and the other part for this session, I was just going to highlight a little bit on discussion. So very similar, you know, I've had, I, mean, I teach in the STEM field, so I'm a biology professor. And when I, when I have my cell bio class, actually, I haven't taught collegiate seminar yet, but I know for some of you that have, you know, how you structure your, your class and you structure the prompts and, of course, having the class discussion. But I find that it's been really useful for, you know, even in the STEM field, because many students have already had that experience in collegiate seminar. So um, one of the books that we, we read is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. So those of you that do not know, that is a, it's a Black woman where the HeLa cells were originated from. So HeLa cells are a very popular um, cell line that many scientists use around the world. Um, and there have been many discoveries and patents behind these cells. And the book dives into the life of, of Henrietta Lacks um, and many of the injustices that were done to her as a, as a, as a Black woman in the 1950s. And, and I really have to say the students really enjoyed the book and being able to give them questions beforehand and they had to write reflections and then we would come to class and then I would have them meet as a group for about 10 minutes in a breakout room and talk a little bit about what were some of the things that really resonated with them in that particular part. And then we would of the of the reading, and then we would come back as a session, and we would have a forty five minute conversation. And usually, I would have to cut it because they were so into the book, um, because it brings in so many aspects of the morals and ethics behind our how we use ourselves, how we treat others, and it really was a sort of this the jumping off point for us understanding informed consent, IRB, HIPAA laws that were not in existence back then. And many of them learned a lot about um, the Mississippi appendectomies. They learned about the, the, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment project. Um, many of them were just appalled because they had never heard of this before. And many of them resonated and said that they this is something that they should have learned in, in grade school and in high school. They should not have had to wait till college. And so that was really helpful to hear their feedback. And I definitely, this is the second time I've done it. and structuring the, the, the seminar style of discussion, the students were really great about either using the chat box um, and or just being able to, to talk and giving each other the freedom to express how they feel. And we came up with sort of a, you know, agreements of how we were going to have, a, have our discussion because there's a lot of um, really intense topics that come up and many people have different opinions. Um, but many of them felt, you know, I, I felt like they had a really good respect for each other. So that's one of the things I've done for class discussions in the STEM field that I find they enjoyed not just having, you know, me talking about membrane transport and membrane structure, but, but really talking a lot about cells. And when we were in person, they would actually get a chance to do cell culture and learn how to culture cells, which is what a lot of that book is about. So it really connected really nicely. So because we're not in person, but they still have the ability to see how those cells are being used, um, that's been really useful. So that's one thing I was just gonna mention for class discussions in, in, in STEM that I found that's been very helpful um, in coming up with ways to engage students. And then the second thing was on using Zoom. So many of you probably use Zoom in different forms. And I find that to get the most engagement from students is I do a lot of stuff in the chat box. And so I'll pose a question, I'll give them a minute or so, and they can put their answers in the chat box. Um, a lot of them utilize it to ask questions. And I also do polls with them. So the polls really do get them thinking. And if I realize, okay, we've been talking about this for about 10 minutes, let's do a poll. And then I get everyone um, to sort of take a break, look at the question, process it a little bit, Normally I do a think pair share if we're in person, but because we're not, 
we can do that. And then we can go through the options and students can give their own feedback about why they chose a certain option and it helps them learn from each other. So they realize that, oh, people really can, they're understanding this and maybe this is a different way to see it. So I use polls quite a bit in my class in addition to utilizing the, the chat box um, as well as other collaborative documents that I use in breakout rooms like Jamboards, as Ellen mentioned. Those are really popular. Um, Google Drawings, um, Google Slides, Google, um, Google Docs. And I can monitor what students are doing in the meantime during that time. And then I can write notes to them and comments, even not being in their breakout room. And then I can actually bring them back out and then we can have a discussion. So it's been kind of nice to be able to engage with them, especially when I have I'm not sure how many students you have in a class, but I, my lower division classes can be upwards of 30 students, 32 students. And so it's a great way to, you know, get the pulse of the class by using breakout rooms and collaborative documents and the Zoom polls and the Zoom and the Zoom chat in order for me to kind of know where they need help um, or where we need to, you know, stop and say, okay, let's reflect on this a little bit more and how does that connect to what we did before? So. I utilize a lot of that to try to make sure that I don't lose them in a you know 65 minute class. So that's a little bit about what I was going to say for synchronous you know work sessions with students because that's pretty much what I do for my my biology based courses. Um, but for that, let's open it up for discussion. Did anybody have any questions for any of us that you you wanted to ask or maybe has something in your class that you thought was useful that you wanted to share with the group? No, I feel like this is my one of my classes sometimes. I'll ask the question, I'm like, is anyone out there? And then they start to laugh. Oh, yes, yeah, go ahead. Well, this is like a freshman question on, <laughs> sorry, but um, when you said polling, what do you mean when you say you do polls? I, I don't know what that means. So with Zoom, you can actually set up a poll. Um, if okay. you go under, when you have a reoccurring, like I have a reoccurring lecture um, Zoom link. And if you go under the Zoom under faculty portal, um, you can you can go under that under that um, recurring you know uh, Zoom session, and at the very bottom of that, um, when you make it, you'll be able to see where you can add polls. And so you can add. Um, usually, I put in questions like multiple choice questions. Um, so I'll put in, all right, here's a here's some you know we talked about ten minutes about this topic, and I usually try to scaffold the question to be a little bit more critical thinking. And then they read it and then they have the option of um, it'll pop up on their screen when you share the poll and then they click it and you actually can watch in real time how students are answering. And so I found that it's very useful if, if for those of you that use polls that you say, OK, you have a minute to do this. And so they don't sort of drag it on. But really, it's something that they've already had seen before and they kind of need to keep processing and we need to keep moving forward. But it's an assessment tool in order for us to be able to um, come in and, and talk about a topic. And I can also see like, oh, they clearly are not getting that. Let's go back again. Um, but polls are what you can embed. And, and if you look at the, um, you probably can't see at the bottom of, because we're in a breakout room, but when you're in the main session, you'll see a little tab for polls. And I usually load them in beforehand. I usually know when I'm probably going to take a break between my content and you can just load it and share it with students. And then the cool thing about Zoom too is that you can actually get the content back. So you can either make it anonymous or you can make it so that way wh whoever's there, you actually can see their answer. So you can use it as a participation tool, but you also could say like, okay, well, this student is definitely struggling. I can see that from their last exam. How are they doing on my poll questions? Yeah, they're not doing so great. And it's more of a jumping off point to get them to realize that maybe this is something they need to like, they need to keep practicing the, the information. So you can do a reach out to them as well. So I've done that, I've done that too when I find that some of them are really struggling. I, I'd like to share um, one thing about Zoom uh, too, which, which is that there's actually a feature for uh, live captioning, which is kind of cool. Um, in, in that Zoom settings, uh, like where, you know, where you could enable the, the, the poll, you could also um, 
set up a uh, live caption and if you, you'll have a captioning button mm -hmm. in the zoom and if you click it you can click enable captioning and then you'll um everyone will have the option to see subtitles um you know while you're hosting the zoom which can which, which can be you know you know helpful for, for universal design um and uh something else that that i wanted to just mention is that um if you have I, I'm, I'm i work in uh, student disability services and we have a um a link uh that basically will let you go into um our um you know management system and be able to see which students in your course have accommodations which can be helpful and that way you can kind of track and see the number of students uh in your course so i'm going to drop that that link in, into into the chat so you so you guys have it and i'm also going to drop in um, a link to our um, home page and in there there's there's tutorial videos on how to set up the zoom captioning and there's one for the the portal as, as well so i just wanted to share that great thank you austin for the um for the, the guest speakers so for virginia and zara i know you guys talked about this but you know, being the fact that you did this online, you know, because everything's mostly online and there was nice, it was a nice way to streamline things. But, you know, going back into the classroom again, do you feel like you would still try to keep the online component for guest speakers? Or do you think that you would go back to um, having them come on to campus? Depending on if that's possible with COVID protocols, but. I think I, I would do both because um, if, some people i have speakers come from the bay area but i can't get la people or new york people mm. you know to come out but the fact that now you know we can do it on as a zoom thing in the classroom would be really cool or just you know do it on zoom at home everybody you know i mean i don't know how how that would work but um i would probably do both depending if i could get a, a a speaker i was really excited about who would be available but only through zoom i think i'd do both yeah i agree i feel like now i would be um i like as i said the in person energy is is really you know valuable to have the 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 guest lecturer there in front of the students mm -hmm. but if it's someone who for whatever reason you know maybe has scheduling difficulties or, or only a limited amount of time, and, you know, they're far away, I could see, I'd be excited about kind of organizing it as kind of a, um, you know, everyone on their individual computers is one thing, but I feel like that we would, we could benefit what from the in-person energy if we're together, all looking at our, you know, projecting, uh, the large projecting image of this. <laughs> and so kind of like a movie, you know, and so that way we still have the interaction but the speaker has some of the convenience of of being able to use zoom or you know some other technology that makes sense yeah i mean it's interesting how we all have different approaches and so it's like trying to find the the best approach for how it will work for our classes and ellen for your for your stuff do you think that um i know you've been doing flip classroom so do you and you said that you feel like there's a little bit maybe a little bit more engagement with it online versus when you go when you're in person so how do you think you sort of see things working going forward then for you yeah good question so actually there is one difference that i forgot to mention in the sort of in-person version versus the not in-person version which i think is kind of important <laughs> which is when i was doing this in person um I was not having students hand in the work that they were doing in class. So I, I said to them, this is what I expect you to be able to do. We will work on it together in class. We worked on it together in class. If they didn't finish it, I said, do it on your own, but I'm not gonna be grading it. Remote, I am grading it. So essentially I have them hand in everything that we've been working together in class, but in order to keep them on it, I just want them to hand it in. So I think that that's something I would continue going back in person just because they're more motivated to make sure it gets done. I mean, I kind of, the reason I changed it was because when we were in person, I could see what was getting done. And if I decided that it wasn't enough, then I could change it. But I wanted the class time to not have this like intense high pressure, got to get through it. But I actually think that that's not such a bad thing. Um, yeah. No, I think so. it, it is helpful to give them that extra feedback. I mean, I 
I kind of know what you mean by that, but being able to sort of see what they're, what they're writing and being able well, to know where they are too, that helps. And make them um, responsible for getting yes, it done. I, and... I would agree. I agree. Yeah. If, if they're not getting it collected, they're not going to actually do it. So, yeah. um, or they don't do it to the full extent and then they're not really getting the most out of it, which doesn't prepare them mm -hmm. for exams and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you Austin for sharing um, that information and thank you to Zara and um, Virginia and Ellen for your, for your feedback on some of the strategies. I think we're going to head back into the main session. So that way we can um, get into the second part um, of the uh, Mixer event. Okay. So we can stop and I will stop recording and we can go ahead and leave the room and go back.